Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Marissa Piccolo, and I am from Trumbull, Connecticut, uh, and I go to UConn studying political science and economics. I came here to Mount Vernon to focus on my project about women in politics and really how we can encourage more young women to be involved in their local communities to solve the greater issue of gender inequity as far as representation in Congress. So this is my project, Local Women League. And for those um, who aren't really sure what the dots are, that's a Senate map. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so to start with my background, it actually, it actually was pretty challenging for me to think exactly where my passion for politics came from, but I've realized it really comes back to this guy, Jonathan Trumbull. He was the first and only colonial governor at the time of the revolution to support the patriotic cause, and my most vivid um, first memory of history and politics was sitting in my third grade classroom I'm learning that my town, Trumbull, Connecticut, was named after this guy. And having that connection to a founding father as a nine-year-old girl was just really empowering to me. I thought it was very cool that the way my town operated in the 1700s wasn't that different than how our local and town government operates today. And that's still a really powerful idea for me to think about. Um, and as far as community, Trumbull, Connecticut is really my home. Um, growing up there, I've had really awesome opportunities, whether it was with the Girl Scouts, soccer or track, which really um, embedded this idea of responsibility to give back to the community that has given me so much. And lastly, um, a really important influence for me and my passion for politics has been my family. Uh, my family isn't political, but um, in 2007 when the housing market collapsed and my dad's company went under, I really learned a lot about the um, lessons of perseverance and optimism and the idea that to get through hard times, um, it's best when we do it together, whether with your family, your community, um, and, or your country. So college experiences. Um, really in college is where I took my passion for helping other people and feeling of a responsibility to give back, um, and really gained some ha really cool hands-on skills and first-hand experiences that really gave me a sense of possibility for my future in politics. So this is me going for another slice of pizza <laughs> um, at our pizza party with Congressman Joe Courtney, who is our um, local congressman at UConn. So starting in college, I got uh, involved with my local communities, whether it was Stores, Connecticut, where UConn is located, 
or Trumbull, Connecticut. Um, and going around registering people to vote, whether it was Trumbull High students, um, everyone was like, Marissa, why are you going back to your high school to register students to vote? But I did. <laughs> um, or students around campus. Um, constantly going up to these students and letting them know that decisions being made in Washington and Hartford, Connecticut influence their daily lives um, continued to drive me and really reminded me why what I was doing was important. And a really, another really important experience for me was interning for this woman, Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro. Um, I, last summer I worked in the district office and got a lot of hands-on experience, a lot of face-to-face -face, um, contact with constituents. And she really became a big role model for me and someone who I personally think um, following off the lessons of George Washington really leads with character and its integrity. Um, she's a woman who is very forthright, very outspoken, very well known. Um, but at the end of the day, just seeing how she interacted with her constituents, um, who she's been representing for about 20 years, and the caring and uh, compassionate demeanor she has when she enters a room with them, just really spoke to me. And third, um, this is me and Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, who is a junior senator from New York. Uh, last fall, I was fortunate to meet her in an event uh, for her group called Off the Sidelines, which encourages young women to run for office. And so she spoke about a story um, recalling when she was in her 30s and wondering whether or not she should take the jump and run for Congress. Um, being at a fundraiser and listening to then-Senator Hillary Clinton say that if you don't like the decisions being made in Washington, you need to change them for yourself. And that quote really stuck with me, uh, the idea of responsibility and really being willing to pass the torch. Um, she then went on to run for Congress and then the Senate. Um, and the message really about jumping in, even if you're uncomfortable at first, but knowing because it's the best thing for your community and for your nation has continued to inspire me. And lastly, <laughs> there's me when we brought the Hillary Clinton bus to campus. So it was through my personal experiences and also in college where I really got um, a more in-depth look at the history of women in politics and current case studies which really um, expanded my knowledge as far as the scope of the problem. This is a picture from 1992, a year that was declared the year of the woman. Uh, in this year, four new female senators were elected, which in itself quadrupled the amount of female senators. This is actually the year that Rosa DeLauro, well, around the time when Rosa DeLauro was elected. So that idea of like a historical connection, just, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so 1992 was really talked about as a huge year of momentum for women. Um, a lot of people were excited to see where we would go from there. However, today, in 2015, 20 years after the Year of the Woman, women make up 19.4% of the current Congress. Um, here's a gender composition chart done by the Washington Post. As you can see, it's, um, even today, overwhelmingly masculine. It has been an increase uh, starting back in 1992. However, today, um, 20 years after that, uh, momentous election, we still aren't even at 20 percent. And to kind of further put it in perspective, according to Pew Research Center, um, the U.S. ranks 33rd out of 49 high-income countries when it comes to the amount of women in national legislatures. And again, um, Afghanistan, Uganda, Uganda, Pakistan, and Iraq all have higher percentages of women currently holding seats in their, state, in their national legislatures than the United States. So in my research, um, I really wanted to look at the state level, um, particularly because I expected that um, women would be a high, have higher proportion of representation because it is more accessible. However, I was surprised that it wasn't exactly that significant of an increase. Again, today in 2015, women account for 24.2% um, on average of state legislatures. Uh, here, the number one state legislature is Vermont with 41.1%, and the bottom three, Louisiana, Oklahoma, and Wyoming, all bounce around that 12 uh, and 13% margin. And I've spoken a lot about the strong female mentors I felt I've had living in Connecticut, and I was surprised to learn last week that the actual number is 28.3%. And to further break it down to the local level, uh, again, in 2015, of about the 1,400 mayors in the United States, women account for 17.5%. So why does it matter? 
Um, well, being a government founded on the ideals of democracy and representative government, the fact that half of our population has been so drastically underrepresented for so long is a fundamental American issue, and it's a conflict of values we haven't fully taken responsibility for yet. Um, women actually vote at higher rates than men. Uh, here's a statistic from 2008. Women constituted 54% of voters, however, constituted only 24% of state legislatures. And of course, when women are in those positions of power and in those decision-making roles, they have been proven to be highly effective. Um, this is a picture from a feature by Time Magazine called Women Are the Only Adults Left in Washington. Um, and it's really talking about how after, during the federal shutdown of 2012, it was the women on both sides of the aisle who really came together and um, got that compromise that drove us forward. So why is this happening? Well, to kind of um, break it down into two main issues, it's resources and then the larger issue of gender socialization and the political ambition gap. So this is a quote by Nancy Pelosi upon being sworn in as the first female speaker of the House, saying, for our daughters and granddaughters, today we have broken the marble ceiling. And this concept of the marble ceiling really speaks to the issue of money and networks for women in politics. Um, my mentor's organization, Emily's List, was actually founded um, on the premise that historically women have had a harder time raising money, uh, which is obviously an essential component of any campaign. Um, not only are women less likely to ask for money, um, but they don't have as large networks to tap into to get that donor base. And this also, of course, speaks to the concept of old boys clubs. Um, Congress, essentially, is an old boys club. <laughs> it wasn't until the, until the 90s, actually, that women even had restrooms that were accessible enough for the Senate floor that they could go out, go to the bathroom, and also vote. And so going back to the larger issue of gender socialization and what we expect for our young women, this is from a study called It Still Takes a Candidate by Richard Fox and Jennifer Lawless. Um, here it tracks basically the interest of young men and women in running and who see politics as a career. I think it's particularly interesting that during um, high school, it's relatively average. Um, I put a dot where I am at 19 years old. And the fluctuation that happens through college really starts to level off in the 20s. And it's really the gap in political ambition here that is partially responsible for the gap in representation we see when these young men and women grow up. And so the study finds that the top indicators for political ambition are one, parental encouragement, two, politicized educational and peer experiences, three, participation in competitive activities, and four, a sense of self-confidence. So how can we fix this? Um, taking both this research and anecdotal experience, um, I really wanted to design my project to put in the terms of uh, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand to get women off the sidelines. Women have uh, historically, even before they've been able to vote, have been involved in political, social, um, religious movements. Uh, they are, as I've discussed, voted at higher rates than men. Um, but we just don't, we need their voices. Um, we need women in positions of power and in those decision-making roles. So going back to the two concepts of resources and political ambition, I really wanted to find a way where I could address the tangible needs of female candidates, such as money, network, sponsors. Um, also by giving them the confidence and support structures they need to take that next step and run, which has led me to my project called Local Women Lead. So my vision, um, and what I hope to see in my lifetime, and I really believe we all will, is to achieve 50-50 gender representation in Congress, uh, to empower young women into decision-making roles for a more democratic vision and for a better nation. And to do this, um, where really I come in, is to create more opportunities for young women to get involved in their local politics, but also to run and win. Uh, really working with uh, state and local focus to build momentum bottom up, to build political capital and longevity for women in politics. And for a strategic plan, um, it's really been boiled down to three words, grassroots, capital, and the next step. I wanna take advantage of the momentum and passion that women have for their local communities um, and really help it bubble up um, in terms of the grassroots level. As far as capital goes, it's actually very interesting that in recent years, the amount of women, the pr proportion of women serving in state legislatures has actually gone down because a lot of these women who were first elected in the 90s are starting to retire, and those young women aren't ready um, to take their place, which further emphasizes the gap. 
the really building that old girls club, if you will. <laughs> yeah. um, three, the next step. Um, also, speaking to that concept of getting off the sidelines. How can we make women um, feel empowered enough not just to vote, to voice their opinions, but to put them in those positions of power? So I really want to build a bench and support future female leaders um, ages 22 to 30. So really after that college fluctuation, um, when otherwise that local ambition gap continues to be on the rise. Um, beyond skills training by facilitating mentorships between them and local party leaders. So a lot of this has come from my personal experience and fulfillment I felt being involved in um, local politics and a lot of female mentors who have stepped up um, and given me advice. But also this is proven by a lot of research done on female candidates, particularly at Rutgers, the American Center for um, Center for American Women in Politics. So this study uh, asks, how can more women be elected to office? Simple question. <laughs> Um, and it starts as one, women need to be recruited. Um, the average statistic bounces around that women need to be asked six to seven times before they seriously consider running. Two, political parties matter. Um, women want to know if they run that they have the resources and that they have the backing, which relates to the third point, organizations help women run. Um, four, more women can run. The question of talent, that's not even a question. Um, today, women actually uh, hold a higher proportion of college Women are graduating at a faster, excuse me. Women are graduating at a faster rate than men. Um, and they do have those experiences and the skill sets that we need. And five resources are important. So speaking again to that idea of money, mentorships, and connections. So my action plan. Um, going back to the three uh, points of grassroots capital and the next step, um, I'm working to develop a political targeting and recruiting program for these young women to identify rising stars in their community and to give them the resources they need to take that next step and run and, fingers crossed, win. <laughs> um, so to do this, I am working to partner with local town committees and state women's caucuses and groups to keep a local focus. Um, uh, this fall and spring, I really want to start reaching out and contacting formerly elected women to kind of act in this mentor and advising capacity for these young women. And Really, I hope my uh, program will provide a setting for collaboration and bipartisanship. Um, there are so many groups that are working uh, with the same cause of empowering women and trying to figure out how we could um, rise women up. And I think this focus on collaboration and bipartisanship is so necessary, especially in my vision of 50-50 gender representation in Congress someday. So in Connecticut, that's really the um, political environment I'm familiar with, but I want to make sure going forward um, in terms of state-by-state -state development, that I'm cognizant of the political environment. Um, for example, in Connecticut, I feel confident we could find enough formerly elected women to volunteer, but I want to be cognizant going forward um, of different constraints in that capacity. And so to really um, make this mentorship more formal, I want to organize around election cycles. Uh, the filing deadline for candidates in Connecticut is June 1st. So I'm really hoping to get these mentor pairs um, connected in about January, which gives them enough time to really explore the option of running um, in the fall and how they could best prepare. And since this group really focuses on mentorship um, and relationship building, I legally, <laughs> I can't really work with the money aspect of campaigns, but I want to be able to provide a resource list for these women so that if they do decide to run, they have the resources necessary. Um, so that's in terms of political action committees and other funding groups. So my goal is to create, um, for this pilot year, three to six mentor pairs for the spring of 2016. Um, really, I'll start with the mentees, which will be partially uh, self-selected um, and also like identification purposes. I'm still working that out with my political targeting program. Um, and then going from there with these mentees, finding the proper mentors, um, someone who has been in their community, um, has been in their party, knows the players, and can really push them in the right direction. So here's a quote I really like to go back to. It's from a feature in Cosmo magazine when I asked 16 female senators um, their advice for young women. And this is Senator Jean Shaheen from New Hampshire saying, go to your community, wherever that is. Get involved in issues that you care about, and then think about how you could advance those issues by running for office. So what can I do? Um, first and foremost, spread the word. 
uh, with all of the progress that women have made in American society, I think it's hard to believe that currently women only make up 20 percent of, not even 20 percent of our Congress. Um, so really being cognizant of this and uh, uh, raising awareness is so important. Uh, two, know your city and council town representative. Attend a meeting. And three, go out there and ask a woman you know to consider running for office. Send her my name. <laughs> we'll talk. All right, so that's my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? John Patrick? So you talked a lot about like pairing mentors. What is your role going to look like when this mm -hmm. pair? Well, I really want um, it to be driven by them. Um, I, I, mentioned, I didn't mention this, but I want to have like two check-in events. Um, obviously, the relationship between a mentor and mentee will depend on like the personal situation. Um, but trying to keep up to date and make sure it's productive. Um, I want to have like two check-in events, whether it's possibly like a cocktail hour or a skills training seminar. Um, of course, after the pilot program, I want to evaluate what worked and what didn't. Mark? Yeah, I noticed with your map in which that like showed the gender mm -hmm. distribution of the state legislatures, there was a lot of variation and even actually yeah. several states that have close to 50-50 gender representation in their mm -hmm. state legislatures. And my question is, do we know what like helps those states reach close to 50-50? I, that's, that's the question. I want to be able to model that success. Um, so yes, it's something in my research I really want to go forward and check, but um, studies have shown that it is those support structures that really let women take the next step. Lyle? Do you see yourself personally being involved in politics by running for public office in the future? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Any, is that it? Amanda. Yeah, that's a good question. I really, um, multiple people I've spoke to have talked about how formerly elected women are tend to be more likely to volunteer um, because they, like you said, it's they have more time. They don't have to really worry about the political ramifications. And then also, Kate made a good point that they want to be involved in politics even though they're so retired um, and really give back to their communities. So um, I really want to work with. Uh, state women's caucuses and their connections, um, both on the Republican and Democratic side, and I know Connecticut has a Republican women's caucus and a Democratic women's caucus, so that's really where I want to begin. Actually, in Connecticut, um, a nonpartisan um, governmental um, group called the um, Permanent Status on the Commission of Women has recently relaunched this program called Young Women Rising, and it's currently a network of women 18 to 30 um, not political, which is also another point I wanted to make. Um, with the title Local Women Lead, I want to appeal to women who may have never even thought that politics is for them. Um, so really pulling from that network and making that network not just um, about trading business cards, but about making mentorships is where I want to take it and the groups I'm trying to incorporate to begin. Melissa? Who was really interested in the political ambition chart yeah. that you showed. Um, and I think I think there's a gap right after college specifically mm -hmm. where there are women who want to be involved, but once they do that like network, yeah. they have a hard time finding, mm -hmm. okay, how do I how do I kind of get back to mm -hmm. being like without this safe spot to yeah. for people, I guess. I was just interested in your thoughts on totally. re engaging yeah. after that time period specifically. That was a major question and obstacle we dealt with. Um, I wanted to do 22 to like 30 year old women because by then most women have started to like settle down in their communities. Right. That way when we build those mentorships, it really could build a solid like pipeline um, and they're getting built up in communities that they would eventually lead. Um, but you're right, there's a lot of great groups that um, target college women, um, elect her. Um, I mean, the gap gets pretty close at around 19 years old. Um, but really facilitating and um, pushing ahead with engagement post-college is kind of a gap that I've found that I want to target. Thank you. Oh, Helen. <laughs> so it sounds like there's all, like the ideas are really 
well figured out. So I'm curious, especially because you are a full time student and yeah. you intend on sitting the bottom of the future, mm -hmm. how do you plan to actually implement all of these ideas and to find partners who will support you yeah. so that the organization well, it's, it's always reassuring to know that there are so many groups in Connecticut that are already kind of working towards this goal. Um, so I definitely want to use their talent and build those teams. Um, well, I, yeah, I'm studying abroad in the fall, so really my goal is to kind of continue to spread the, spread the word about this initiative and build networks, because um, I really want it to be self-sustaining. Um, I mean, these are, like young, these are young adult women who um, really have a desire to make an impact in their communities, so I want to take advantage of their own momentum as well. Dr. Bradley? I was really intrigued by your use of John Trumbull. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One of the reasons he's one of the only governors that supported the revolution is he was elected. Yeah, exactly. Like the other governors were moral governors. So yeah. That was a really nice yeah. touch. Uh, do you think that young women can be inspired by old, dead, white men <laughs> like a troll yeah, and so true. Like Washington? Mm -hmm. Or is it only the, the modern? Yeah. Uh, uh, woman that inspires young women. Yeah, well, I mean, I was inspired by John Trumbull and being, um, <laughs> being here in Mount Vernon, there's lessons of like leading with character and leading with integrity that obviously applies to everyone. So I think really kind of like reclaiming those figures for women, which seems so distant, but also acknowledging the fact that um, we need role models who look like us and who have gone through the same experiences. I know Admiral Michelle Howard talked about the importance of um, the African American woman uh, character on Star Trek and how that inspired her. <laughs> Um, so being able to like reclaim those um, universal themes of leadership while also acknowledging that as a young woman, it's been really great to see women leading in Connecticut. And that's really inspired me. Can I piggyback on that with uh, Admiral Howard's uh, talking about it, in a lot of the talk was the kind of uh, transformation of the military to include women in higher and higher ranks. To what extent do you think that will impact uh, women running for office because you have a lot yeah. of these women Veterans now who might be totally. a great pool of yeah. public servants, future public servants. It's really good to think about. Um, well, I know, like, it's also nice to talk about how um, when women are inspired to run, a lot of times it is like to make a difference. And Senator Kirsten Gillibrand talked a lot about that. Um, when she was elected, she made it a point to be on the Armed Services Committee to deal with the issues of women in the military and making it more open, and also in terms of sexual assault in the military. So I think that inclusiveness um, really ripples off um, and affects. The entire society has been very positive. Well, one more question for you. If you could choose one woman in politics right now to be a mentor, who would that woman be? Good. Really, question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I really am making an effort to make this project like bipartisan, not and um, nonpartisan. But I am a huge Hillary Clinton fan. It's surprising. <laughs> um, for me, she's just someone who has been through so much. Um, I think looking at her campaign today versus her 2008 campaign, um, where she felt like she had to put on that hard face, um, it's really inspiring to see her today and talk about her role as a grandmother and that femininity um, as added strength for her. So that's who that is her. <laughs> Thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, well hi, I'm Ileana Rivron. I am a junior at Harvard College studying economics and getting a minor in Spanish. I'm originally from Wausau, Wisconsin. And today I'll be speaking to you about my cause, which is eating disorders prevention in the ballot community. Three point five percent of the U.S. population suffers from an eating disorder. Among the dance or the athlete population, this number jumps all the way up to thirteen point five percent. Now, based on these statistics, what do you think the number might be for the dancer population? As many as eighty-three percent of dancers meet lifetime criteria for anorexia, bulimia, both, or eating disorders not otherwise specified. Now, the gravity of this issue really is magnified when we consider the fact that 50% of, of anorexics also suffer from clinical depression. And worse yet, eating disorders are the most deadly mental illness. So why is this my cause? Well, to explain that, I'll have to tell you a bit about my story. When I was 13 years old, just about to turn 14, I moved from my small town in Wisconsin all the way across the country to Boca Raton, Florida to attend the Herod Conservatory, a ballet boarding school. Two years later, I got into my dream school, the Royal Ballet School in London, England. So I moved there. And then three years after that, upon graduation, I got a job at Boston Ballet. So I moved there and um, spent two years dancing there before matriculating at Harvard. Now, when I was at the Royal Ballet School, we were weighed about six times a year, and the results were reported to our ballet teachers and our artistic director. The rule for a long time at the school was that in order to be allowed to dance, dancers had to have, female dancers had to have a body mass index of lower than 18%. Now, why that number? This wasn't an arbitrary figure. You see, females need about 18% body fat in order to function reproductively. So the goal, although it wasn't explicit, was that if dancers can stay below that, they can de delay maturation. They can stay in their prepubescent, stick-thin, young girl bodies. That sounds absolutely crazy to the general population, but there are actually legitimate reasons why this kind of thinking prevails. You see, ballet isn't an individual sport. It's also a partner sport. So around this time, as we go away to boarding schools, the boys have to learn how to do this. And boys actually mature much later than girls. And unfortunately, they, it's very unfair. They only need about 5 to 6% body fat in order to function reproductively. So as they were struggling to take in enough calories so that they could grow into men and be able to do this, the girls are struggling to starve themselves so that they wouldn't grow into women so that they could do this. Now, my friends were constantly told to lose weight, and there's really no reprieve from the issue. You spend eight hours a day, six days a week, in front of a mirror in skin-tight clothing, and you're constantly comparing your body to your classmates. Words like, I'm fat, and I wish I could chop off this or that part of my body were just everyday occurrences. So I saw my friends deal with this through all sorts of extreme measures. Many dancers, chew gum or smoke incessantly in order to fool their brains into thinking that they're full. The staples of many dancers' diets are rice cakes, which are basically all air, um, or these chemical-laden, fake, highly processed, highly refined foods that have this label low calorie or zero calorie because they were safe foods. Um, because a lot of dancers don't want to eat during the day so because they don't want to feel bulky, they would starve themselves for the majority of the day and then go home and feel ravenous, understandably, and overeat and then feel guilty and either have to purge through laxatives or through puking or through um, further exercise. So in order to have energy throughout the day as you're starving yourself, caffeine was very necessary. Coffee and Diet Coke Zero were everywhere. And the stories get crazier and crazier. I've even heard that at the School of American Ballet in New York City, dancers will put themselves on the cotton ball diet, which is they eat cotton balls or tissue and then drink water so that it expands in their stomach and makes them feel full. Now, all this time, the craziest part perhaps is that we were actually given nutritional education. At the Herod Conservatory, we had a year-long course on nutrition. 
at the Royal Ballet School, we had a nutritionist on staff, and we were referred to her if we were either too skinny or too fat. So why, despite this education, did these types of eating patterns prevail? Well, I have now come to know that it's because the approach is completely wrong. You see, we were given all of these do's and don'ts and these lists of good foods and bad foods. But dancers know all of this stuff, and yet they still choose to eat unhealthily or have these unhealthy behaviors. And that's because these behaviors are not a result of thoughtlessness or ignorance. Rather, they have a very well thought out rationale. They justify and rationalize their actions in their minds because they'll do anything for this sport. So if we are to actually combat this issue, that's what we have to address, the unhealthy pathology that underlies the behavior. Now, I count myself exceedingly blessed because I was spared from having a full-fledged eating disorder for really one reason. And that is because my mom happens to be a psychiatrist who specializes in eating disorders and actually ran an eating disorders clinic. So she taught me from a very young age that healthy food is not something you impose upon yourself. It's not a punishment. Rather, it's life-giving and delicious, and it's something to be celebrated. She taught me that it's not about the rules. So I never had a list of do's and don'ts that I felt the need to rebel against, like my friends did through binging. Perhaps most importantly, she taught me to understand the biology of how food breaks down in the body. And equipped with this, these scientific principles, I was able to be creative and come up with meals and snacks that would optimally fuel my instrument. And I could vary this depending on what kind of rehearsal schedule I had, um, maybe if I had a performance and it was more intense, or if I had a role that required more stamina than, than usual. Um, I knew how to vary my diet. She taught me that being skinny and having strength, energy, and stamina are not mutually exclusive. And it is possible to have that ideal ballet body while still maintaining your health. And last, but certainly not least, she taught me that diets don't work. So while my friends were eating rice cakes and coffee, I was eating about 2,400 calories a day, which is almost double what many women in our society eat every day. And that's because I knew how to eat. Now, while I was spared from having a full-fledged eating disorder and the lifelong consequences that come with that, I have witnessed too many of the people that I love so much have their lives destroyed by this. My best friend in the whole world had to quit ballet at the same, in the same year that I did because as a 20-year-old, she has the bone density that is on par with a 60-year-old osteoporotic woman. On a bone density scan, her bones show up looking like pumice stone. They're holy. And that's from years of malnutrition. And that's not an isolated case. So I've just seen too much hurt to stand by in silence. I believe that the best way to attack this issue is to reach out to dancers at the time when they are first deciding that they want this to be their professional career. If we give them the tools that they need, the psychological tools and the information that they need right at that critical junction in their lives, then they're, they have these skills in order to cope with the lifestyle that they are pursuing. Which leads me to my mission statement. I aim to decrease the prevalence of eating disorders in the ballet community by improving prevention and treatment efforts in pre-professional ballet schools. Specifically, I advocate for a holistic approach to nutritional education that addresses the unhealthy pathology perpetuated by the aesthetic and physical demands of this athletic art form. Now, how do I aim to do this? Well, here's my plan of action. First, by improving dance nutritionist training standards. Secondly, creating a task force on dancer health for pre-professional ballet schools. And third, initiating ballet school reform. Now I'll speak to each of these in a moment. Um, but first, I'd just like to say, you know, I'm a full-time college student, so how will I find time to do this? This semester, I'm planning on taking one of my four courses at Harvard as an independent study course, in which I can devote my time to doing just this. So the first initiative. The fact that nutritionists um, teach these courses at dance schools that aren't effective is really not their fault, actually, because they're doing exactly what they were trained to do. Because nutritionists that work at dance schools don't have to have any um, official training in psychology, in eating disorders specifically, and they don't even need to really understand ballet. 
So the Academy of uh, the American Academy of Sports Dietitians and Nutritionists and the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals both offer online webinars and online written information resources that speak to the first of these two topics, including body image, weight, and food issues, and eating disorders prevention, early recognition, and treatment. So I would like to advocate for Valley School directors to encourage the nutritionists that they work with to obtain this extended education. They don't need to get a whole nother degree, but they do need to have an understanding of these very vital topics. In addition, I would like to work with these organizations to create more webinars and online informational resources um, that are specifically for nutritionists who want to work with ballet so that they can help their students understand how to change their diet based on the varying demands of uh, ballet season. Secondly, I would like to create a task force on dancer health for pre-professional ballet schools. In 2006, health professionals from all around North America volunteered and got together to create a task force on dancer health for ballet companies. And some of their goals include supporting, and supporting the health and wellness of the individual dancer, encouraging health screenings, and creating a support network of dance health professionals so that dancers have people they can reach out to, and also so that the health professionals can share data and research and assess their treatment and prevention efforts. Thankfully, the physical therapist that I worked with at Boston Ballet happens to be the chair of the um, institutional review board for this task force. So one of the first things I'll be doing after this program is reaching out to her and asking, what, what will it take to create a similar task force for pre-professional ballet schools? This is the more fieldwork aspect of my initiatives. In order to um, start a campaign for ballet school reform with these uh, key topics, I'm going to start with just one ballet school, and that will be my first ballet boarding school, the Harriet Conservatory. And I'll have five main things that I want to achieve there. The first is um, a short talk series during their summer program. At that time, they have about 100 students between the ages of 13 and 17 years old. And I'd like to speak to them and give a, conduct a survey before and after um, to measure their understanding of eating disorders and nutrition before and after. I'd also like to station myself in the dining hall and observe their eating patterns and see how they change, if at all. And lastly, this, this third bullet point refers to the work that my mom and I have been doing for the past five years. We've been writing a book that aims to um, make nutritional science easily digestible, so to speak, for an adolescent audience. So the first half of the book is focusing on the scientific principles, and the second half of the book is to build psychological tools necessary for living a healthy life. So that will be the material that I use for this talk series. Secondly, I'd like to work with the current nutritionist um, on her year-long course curriculum, and it's the same nutritionist that was there when I was a student there. Um, I'd like to highlight our common goals that we truly are hoping for the same thing, optimizing um, dancer performance and dancer health. And I'd just like to look at the curriculum and see where we can incorporate more of a psychological approach and also tailor it to dance's specific needs. Third, I'd like to interview the director and artistic staff to assess their awareness and, and their attitude towards their dancer's health and eating disorders. Fourth, I'd like to improve dining hall standards, and this is huge because when I was at the Harriet Conservatory, I remember a time when we were all told, everyone in the room, lose 10 pounds. And we went back to the dining hall and there are pizza and burritos and burgers and the food was greasy, unappetizing, and of poor quality. So, you know, if we are hoping to have dancers listen to our advice and take our advice, we have to give them the resources to do so. I mean, the key is to make eating healthily easy and enjoyable. And then lastly, I will assess this methodology and expand to other boarding schools. That's my hope. So to conclude, I would like to pay tribute to a dancer who really has been an inspiration to me during this, this cause. He, has, is a huge, he was a huge um, advocate for the arts in America. And he also used his skills on the dance floor to bring joy to a community. George <laughs> Washington, the dancer. <laughs> now, George Washington Park Custis, this, um, this man's very own step-grandson, step 
spoke to this less known side of our, very, our nation's first president. So let's see what he, he says. It was on this festive occasion that General Washington danced a minuet with Mrs. Willis. The minuet was much in vogue at that period and was peculiarly calculated for the display of the splendid figure of the chief and his natural grace and elegance of airy manners. As the evening advanced, the commander-in-chief yielding to the general gaiety of the scene went down some dozen couple in the confidence with great spirit and satisfaction. So let's give a hand to Washington, the dancer and advocate for the arts. <laughs> talk on this lighthearted note, not to downplay or diminish the grim reality that 83% of dancers face through this mental illness. Rather, I do so because my cause really is to restore that general gaiety to dance. After all, dance shouldn't be a source of psychological disturbance, mental health, and permanent physical, psychological, mental, emotional damage. It shouldn't be and it doesn't have to be because it is possible to attain that ideal ballet body and have health. I want, and that's exactly what I want for this art form that I still feel so passionate about. I want to sit in the audience and know that these dancers who have dedicated their lives to this aren't doing so at the expense of their lifelong health. I want to sit in the audience and know that these incredible athletes and artists are getting as much joy out of their work as they are giving. And that's why this is my cause. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Thank you so much for that. That was really illuminating, and I really appreciate knowing more about this issue. I was curious that you mentioned some of the causes as being both that nutrition and psychological aspects. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and yet your solutions were a lot, very much focused on the nutrition and eating breakfast. So I wonder, how do you imagine kind of the psychological dimension and kind of addressing that culture of body shaming is really what it sounds like in the culture of these ballet schools, as well right. as improving the nutrition and food aspects? That's a really great question. I think a huge part of it is just the understanding that being skinny and healthy are not mutually exclusive. I think that's huge. Um, so many dancers engage in these unhealthy eating patterns because they think that the nutritionists who are working with them don't understand that they actually do have to stay that skinny so that boys can lift them and so that they can lift their legs and move quickly and jump. Um, so I think a huge part of it is if the nutritionists are on the same page and are able to um, say that we all have the, com the same common goals. We want to figure out a way for you to have that, that body that you need in order to get a job because truly you won't get cast and you won't get a job if you don't have that body, unfortunately. Um, and for, if dancers know that those are the same goals and they understand that, I think they're going to be willing to work with them a lot more. Um, I think also understanding that the nutritional science aspect of it is a, a way to improving the psycho psychological aspect um, is huge because a lot of times it's seen as, um, I don't know, that like they're separate issues, but I think they're absolutely connected. Yeah. So you touched a lot about like the female aspect of it, and women who are struggling with this. Is there also the same problem for the female population? Yes. How do you address that? That's a really good question. Um, more often than not, they have the opposite problem, <laughs> where they are trying to take in enough calories so that they can get through the demanding physical schedule. And especially, I mean, they, um, while we had point classes, like working on point, um, they would have upper body classes. So they're, you know, in the gym working on just building enough strength to lift girls above their heads. Um, so usually, they, I mean, honestly, they would just eat as much as they possibly could all the time. So it's not quite the same problem. Um, but they take these nutrition courses as well. So I think it's huge for them to also understand what girls are dealing with and um, be able to support them rather than seeing this as, well, it's the worst feeling in the world to hear a boy grunting as he's trying to lift you up your head. So I think if they understand the issue as well, it will definitely be encouraging for the females and vice versa. 
But the size of the attrition is extremely complicated and easy for human pressure. How do you make this accessible to that particular age group in a way that really resonates with them? Yeah, um, and that is difficult. I think I could give a couple of examples just um, to make it a little bit more clear. So, one thing is that a lot of dancers will. One of the interesting pattern, eating patterns that they do is they will eat a cookie or a pizza or something and, and just taste it, chew it for a little while and spit it out, or they'll eat it and, and purge it. Um, and I think something that they should know is that the first thing that your body absorbs is the sugar and the refined carbohydrates. The last thing are the protein, the healthy fats, and the fiber. So what they're purging is anything that is of any nutritional quality in what they're eating. But they're taking in the sugar that's going to turn into fat. So that's why bulimics, unfortunately, or I don't know, but bulimics often um, aren't any skinnier than the average population and it goes on unnoticed for a very long time, undiagnosed, because a lot of times they won't lose weight for those are the same reasons, and yet they're still engaging in these incredibly unhealthy behaviors. Another example is why diets don't actually work, um, and a lot of people don't know this, but anytime you engage in restrictive eating, your body automatically shuts down um, or slows down the metabolism. And this was an amazing mechanism that, it's a protective mechanism that God gave us because in a time of famine, for instance, you need to be able to conserve energy to survive. So when dancers, and this happens a lot, will starve themselves for weeks on end leading up to a certain performance so that they can look good in a certain costume. Afterwards, when they go back to their refeeding, what happens is your body naturally overshoots its set point or the average weight that it naturally hovers around in order to prepare itself for the next period of semi starvation just in case. So they end up gaining more weight than the weight that they had lost. And also your body gets better and better at conserving energy with each new dieting period. So that's why yo-yo dieting, which is on and off dieting, is probably the most ineffectual way to lose weight or maintain a low body weight there is. Because each time your body gets better and better at not letting you lose weight. <laughs> so things like that. Um, and that's exactly what I mean by like, nutritional science that needs to be addressed so that these unhealthy eating patterns can, can be eliminated. Yes. Right. Well, first of all, congratulations. There's a really bravo performance there. Wonderfully done. <laughs> <laughs> you, you describe a crisis which, uh, you know, which is really you know, impressively drawn out. It strikes me that, um, I mean, so are you a lone voice in the wilderness here? I mean, what are the other organizations that exist that, that are describing this crisis, trying to do something about it? Uh, how much resistance are you going to get even at your own school uh, with the nutritionist that was there when you were there? Uh, I don't know if you were clucking in the, in, in the classroom or the nutritionist was working. Or, I mean, what relationship you have? I mean, where is the... So, what are your answers, I guess? Those multiple. Right. Um, so, I guess to that last point, uh, luckily I still have a very good relationship with the artistic staff and the director and the nutritionist um, at the Heritage Conservatory. And I think my um, the way I'm going to address that is just to highlight, again, our, our common goals. That I'm not, I'm not trying to put the nutritionist out of the job. In fact, she's the first line of defense. We need her. Um, and it's not as if her training is wrong or oh, like completely ineffectual in itself. It's that there needs to be more that's done. So really just advocating for that. Um, and I, I think I will, I mean, I'm not the only voice. Um, there are a lot of different people speaking out about this. But I think what I'm trying to find is where is why there are still weaknesses, what are the cracks in the system, because, I mean, this is, it's not going anywhere, and I still have friends going through these systems and the same things are happening. Um, I think one of the organizations that I mentioned, the International Association of Eating Disorders Professionals that um, offers the webinars online, my mentor here who works at the Eating Disorders Coalition actually referred me to someone who um, used to be a professional dancer, she was a rockhead, and she wrote a book called Too Too Thin, a guide to dancing without an eating disorder. Mm -hmm. um, so there are people, I'm going to reach out to her, but I mean, that book isn't being taught anywhere or used at ballet schools. And that she 
she didn't go to a Valley Brain School, so that's not her um, round language, but that's maybe why it hasn't reached them. So I would love to just connect those people as well, because I have that fortunate um, opportunity with my connections. Uh, but you're very convincing. When you do write the book, you have, if you have some recipes in it, you have an infomercial, you'll sell a lot of copies. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working on my ballet body for a while. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to purchase it. It's a secret. Yes. Uh, how long did you on? What's going to be your speech and your presentation do and how you were able to uh, to manage and help them deal with issues that all, all the other chapters uh, are facing. It seems that your relationship with your mother and the support that you have from, from your mother and your mom is a big reason. And so, something you need to think about when we're trying to uh, uh, make an impact at the movie school level. So if you're not writing a book, making it a book that is geared towards parents of the girls who are before they get to school, so that when they're going to the school, they're asking the questions of the school, what are you, what are you doing about it? How are you going to care for my daughter when I send her away to you to, to uh, bring her place here? Right, and that's a really good point. Um, actually, we've been, throughout this fellowship, um, been doing logic models and human design-centered thinking, or human-centered design thinking, um, and a huge question that we look at is who are the stakeholders and how can you appeal to their interests? So in writing in these activities, um, as I was writing that out, parents, ballet teachers, ballet directors, nutritionists, um, the general public who has gained an awareness through movies like Black Swan or um, the, the new principal dancer, Misty Copeland, who's gotten quite a lot of um, fame. So one of the things that I'm looking into is through the um, webinars and the online written information resources, and possibly through the book eventually as well, um, creating different uh, avenues, I guess, or platforms for each of those stakeholders. So one for the valid teachers, one for the parents of the students, one for the students themselves. Um, because I, I do think that all of those voices um, need to be collectively going towards the same vision. Amanda. You mentioned that you wanted to go this summer to your school. Are you thinking of spending the summer there to be working on the information gathering or to do some of the observations you were saying? Are you going to do as well? How are you going to start kind of this long planning? That's a very good question. Um, I have a few ideas bouncing around in my head. Um, so either, I, I mean, really, I think it would only take about um, two weeks in one summer program, so I could possibly go to multiple. Um, another option is that because I might be studying abroad um, in the spring, and if I go where I would like to go, Buenos Aires, um, I would be there till mid-July. They still do have the last two weeks of their program, so it would still be possible. But another option is um, I'm looking at Christmas break as well, possibly going there then instead. Um, and really, I, I'm not sure how to scale it, um, or how many boarding schools to reach out to at, at first, so that's something I'm looking into. Hi. Yeah, you briefly uh, touched upon your independent study at college. Um, are you considering, I guess, getting your university more involved in the past, reaching out to alumni or even professors who have a background in nutrition, or just general nutritional policy? So. I, I am considering that. Um, looking into that, but I, I think it is such a unique um, world, and we the approach that is currently prevailing is the nutritionists who aren't who don't have an understanding of ballet, and so it's that's kind of already I feel like been done a little bit. So um, that's why I'm focusing on a different route, but I do still think that I could use any support to doing that too. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> so that concludes our capstone presentations for this afternoon. Um, we are also doing the rest of our capstone presentations starting at 10.30 to noon tomorrow and then from 1.30 to 5.00. So, 
Um, please, as many people who can come, please attend. We'll be in Smith Auditorium um, tomorrow, and I would love to see, see you all there. Thank you so much for coming today.
it's a matter of parts in there. Disrupt our work. Yeah, I just care. Yeah. Right we don't give any free tools in our work. But the see these lights? It costs money to keep these lights. We got the air conditioning on, we got the floor right on. That's because we work it. Better than being hot. Not too hot. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
a special thank you to them. We don't have any We're not worried about it yet. Get it put like some. I like this creative thing. Some aura of the audience got access to them that it's like really bad. Yeah, I get them. Yeah, they can drink, but there's like, there's someone in the, the top of the room. Oh. 